we've been talking about periodic trends, properties of the chemical elements that you can predict about their atoms based upon their position on the periodic table. And we talked yesterday about atomic radii. You'll see that on your next homework assignment that'll be due tomorrow. And then we're gonna talk about two other trends today, ionization energies, and then something called electron affinities. Ionization energy, we actually defined in experiment three when we were talking about the hydrogen atom. An ionization means you pull an electron off of an atom. So the ionization energy is the energy needed to pull an electron off of an atom. It's actually defined as the energy change for the removal of an electron from a gaseous atom, which means you need to have the element in its gaseous state. And when you do, if you supply energy, you can cause an electron to be removed. And let's think about this. The atom would now have one less negative charge. So now it would now become an ion instead of an atom and its charge would be positive one. <clears throat> now, the reason the definition is uh, the energy uh, needed to remove an electron from a gaseous atom, the reason that's the definition is if the atom was a solid, uh, the element was in its solid state and you started applying energy to it, the first amount of energy absorbed would melt it. Then a little bit more energy would boil it and then any excess energy after that would pull the electron off. So we never want to know how much energy it takes to melt and boil if we want to know the ionization energy. So therefore, by definition, we always start with a gaseous atom, okay? So when this process occurs, <clears throat> this is an energy change that occurs. It can either absorb energy or release energy. And there's some terms we use talking about energy changes. Endotherms is the term we use for a process in which energy is absorbed. And we talked about this also in our Bohr uh, lab experiment three when an energy change uh, occurs where the uh, operation causes absorption of energy, energy is going into the system, we define that energy change as a positive value. So for an endothermic process, the change in energy, which would be abbreviated delta E, would be a positive number. If a process occurs that releases energy, then to show that it's releasing instead of absorbing, the delta E value would be given negative, and we call that type of change an exothermic process. So this would be any process in which energy is released, and you would see the algebraic sign for the energy change as a negative number for that. <clears throat> now, when you pull an electron off of an atom, it takes energy to do that. Okay, if you're holding your candy bar and I come up to you and I go, I want that candy bar from you, and I gr I've got to use energy to rip that candy bar out of your sweaty little hands, right? It takes energy to pull an electron away from an atom, just like it takes energy to pull a candy bar out of your hand. So that means that ionization energies are always endothermic. They're always gonna be positive values and you'll see a bunch of numbers for those today. So this is the reason why. They're telling how much energy needs to go into the system, how much energy do you have to use to pull that electron out, okay? Now, if you have an atom with multiple electrons and all atoms except for hydrogen have multiple electrons, you can supply energy to pull off one electron. You could supply energy to pull off two electrons, three electrons. And if you just calculate how much energy it takes to pull off each successive electron, those are called successive ionization energies. And we're gonna talk about those in terms of the element magnesium. If you have the element magnesium, it's composed of billions and billions of magnesium atoms and from the periodic table, magnesium's atomic number is 12. That means a magnesium atom has 12 protons and 12 electrons. So magnesium actually has 12 ionization energies. There's an ionization energy for pulling off the first electron, an amount of energy it takes to pull off the second electron, an amount of energy it takes to pull off the third, all the way down to all 12 of them. So if I wanted to pull off just one electron from the magnesium atom, I would supply a specific amount of energy and that would cause an electron to be released and you would wind up creating a positive ion. So I've written a little chemical equation here, just like we wrote on the previous uh, slide with an element X, which was a generic element. So if you have any particular element, you wanna write the equation for its ionization energy, you have to write one atom of the element yields the positive ion of that element plus an electron, okay? If we look at a magnesium atom, you think, I wonder which electron would be pulled off if any of you are basketball players, 
you would have definitely learned how to hold a basketball when you're on offense and somebody's playing defense against you. And the way you do that is you hold the basketball close to your body under your chin. You keep it close to you because it's hard for them to steal. Nobody on any serious basketball team is going to stand on the court and hold the basketball out in front of them three feet away from their body because somebody else is going to slap that ball out of their hands and steal it. The moral of the story is it's easier to steal a basketball when it's further away from the person's body. It's easier to pull off an electron when it's further away from the nucleus of the atom. So the electron that would be pulled off first in the magnesium atom would have to be one of those two electrons that are in the third energy level of the magnesium atom. They're the ones that are furthest away. They're the ones that will be the easiest to remove. So this might be the first one that gets pulled off. So we supply the energy and boom, that electron gets pulled off. And what you have left now is something with 12 protons in the nucleus and only 11 electrons. So it has a positive one charge. Now, experimentally, you can't determine this theoretically. So these are measured values. But the energy to remove that first electron from a magnesium atom is 736 kilojoules per mole. That's how much energy it takes to pull one electron off of a mole of atoms. I probably should have given you the amount of microjoules needed to pull the uh, electron off of just one atom, but it's usually given as kilojoules per mole, okay? Now, we've created a positive one ion, 12 protons, 11 electrons. If I take that positive one ion and I zap it with some more energy, I can cause a second electron to be removed and let's figure out what you would get. If you pull another negative charge off, then the ion that's left over now would have a charge of positive two. So we would create a positive two ion and a second free electron would be removed. What electron would be pulled off of the atom? Once again, it's always gonna be the one that's furthest from the nucleus. That's the easiest one to pull off. So this is gonna be the second electron removed. And then when you supply whatever energy it takes, boom, that electron gets pulled off. And experimentally, we know what that energy is. It's 1,451 kilojoules. Now, if I take this particular ion, which is now a positive two magnesium ion because it has 12 protons, but only 10 electrons. And if I add energy to that, I can cause another electron to be removed. And if I pull one more electron off, you can now imagine what's gonna be true about the charge of the created ion. It's gonna be positive three. And the third electron is gonna be removed. What electron will be pulled off now? Well, now you have a choice of eight different electrons because there are eight electrons that are all in the second energy level. So one of those will be removed. I'll pick one randomly, this one. So this will be the third electron pulled off. So if we supply the right amount of energy, bing, pull that off. And this is our magnesium positive three ion that's been created. Energy required to do that is 7,728 kilojoules per mole. And if I just do this one more time for fun, if we take the magnesium positive three ion and add energy to that, you can pull off a fourth electron, creating a magnesium positive four ion and a fourth free electron. And the electron that would be pulled off would be now one of those seven electrons that are in its highest energy level, the second energy level, maybe this one. So if I supply the right amount of energy, beep, that one gets pulled off and I have my magnesium positive four ion and the energy required to do that turns out to be 10,534 kilojoules. Um, I have a question, Professor. Go for it. Um, so I know, so when you do, okay, so um, after the first ionization energy, it's um, the Mg plus ion and then plus an electron, why, okay. wh why would it be more? Because I would have figured that it would take less energy to get rid of the electron because it wants to get rid of that one to okay, have a so full. Perfect question. perfect question. So first, don't personify the atoms. The atoms don't <laughs> want anything. People want no. things. All right. atoms try to achieve a lower energy state. But, and I understand what you're saying, but let me show you why that's actually not correct, okay? Every single electron is being attracted to the nucleus, okay? So if they're being attracted and you wanna pull an electron out, it's gonna require energy to separate those from each other. Doesn't matter whether the atom becomes more stable later for some magical reason, octet, but it, uh, it, you have to overcome the physics of the fact that the negative electrons are next to the positive nucleus, they're attracting. How do you separate them? You use energy to do that. So these have to be endothermic processes. 
Now, your other question was, it doesn't seem like these numbers should be getting bigger, you said, because maybe you want to try to make a, a octet configuration or something. If you had the very first atom we had, had 12 protons and 12 electrons, and you pull one electron out, there's now less electrons in the entire atom. Is that correct? Yeah. All these electrons are actually repelling against each other a little bit. And their repulsion means it's going to be easier than you think to pull the electron off. But if you remove electrons, now any one electron has less other electrons repelling against it. So that means it gets to focus in, I'm personifying there, how unfortunate. That means that if you have less other electrons there, there's less repulsion in this atom, and therefore the attraction of the nucleus is a bigger effect. So every time you pull electrons out of the atom, you decrease the amount of overall electrons in the atom, so the electrons feel less repulsion to each other, so therefore the attraction becomes a greater percentage of their energy, and therefore they're held more tightly. So the successive ionization energies are always going to increase, because every time you pull an electron off, you're causing less electron-electron repulsion in the newly created ion, and so each electron, therefore, has less repulsion, but the same amount of attraction. And so they actually hold to the nucleus more strongly. So it's always going to take um, more energy to pull out successive electrons. Does that physics make sense to you a little bit? Yeah, I, I was just thinking, because I do remember learning, like, I know after the second ionization energy, it gets significantly greater because oh, of that. So really I was just thinking, point. I don't know. So that's what I want you to understand, okay? Ms. Quickly just recognized that, gee, the third and the fourth ionization energies are really, really high. So why is that? You have to think about where the third and fourth electrons are coming from. Ms. Quickly recognized the first two electrons were being removed, remember, from the third energy level. They're really far from the nucleus. So if they're really far from the nucleus or they're more shielded from the nucleus, it doesn't take much energy to pull them out. So the first and second electrons can be removed easily. But the third and fourth electrons are coming from closer to the nucleus where they're less shielded, they're held more tightly. So Ms. Quigley, the point is you'll have elements like magnesium that will actually have low ionization energies for their valence electrons. So you know what? It's actually pretty easy for another atom to come up to it and attract those two electrons away from it because it only takes a small amount of energy to pull it out. But is another atom going to come up next to the magnesium and pull off a third electron? That energy is 7,728. That's a really high number. So it's probably not going to happen. Okay. So when you look at successive ionization energies for an atom, you will notice that there's always small ionization energies when you remove valence electrons because they're so far from the nucleus, they're so shielded, they don't experience the attraction of the nucleus very much. But once the valence electrons are gone and now you go to a lower energy level that's closer to the nucleus that has less shielding, those are going to be attracted much more strongly. So the ionization energies get really, really high. So that's an important concept about valence electrons. And this is why so many elements lose their valence electrons when they undergo chemical reactions. Magnesium doesn't lose two electrons to become happy. Atoms can't be happy, right? That's personification. Magnesium atoms just happen to have two very low ionization energies, so it's easy for other atoms to pull those two off, but it's too hard to pull any others off, so that's why magnesium will form ions that have a charge of positive two. Ms. Quickly, that makes sense? Yeah, it so, does. Thank you. So, Professor, what if we're taking uh, ions from or electrons from the d orbital? Will that be the case? Will the third ionization have such a high increase, even though it's not going to be like a core electron? Yeah, usually it's not. And so what happens is when you have an element that's in the D block of the periodic table, and you may lose easily your two outer shell S electrons, because the D electrons are not so much uh, more stable, their ionization energies are not quite as high, you can actually lose those as well. So when we eventually talk about what kind of ions the D block elements form, it's not going to be an easy question because sometimes they lose their S electrons, sometimes they lose S and D electrons. There's actually a lot of op different options that actually can happen there. So there is not a big block, a big difference in energy between, let's say, a 4S sublevel 
and a 3D sublevel. So that means maybe in that instance, you could have 4S and 3D electrons both be removed. But we'll get to that eventually. Okay. okay. Uh, sir, can I ask a quick question too? Go for it. When there's multiple electrons in an energy level, are, that, are they all equally likely to be removed? Uh, if you're going to pull one out and you're going, which one is going to be pulled out, you mean? Yeah. Uh, no, it depends what sublevel they're in. So whichever sublevel has the least amount of penetration through the shielding will be the one that's actually the easiest to pull off. So for example, if you have, let's say, four valence electrons, two S electrons and two P electrons, the P electrons, because the radial probability distribution of a P orbital does not allow as much probability inside the shielding, those will get pulled off first. So you always okay. pull the electrons off first, then S's would come second. And if you broke it down even further to the two electrons in the P orbital, though? Um... It's not really hard to tell. You don't really see too much difference there. Okay. Okay. So I want you to take a look at the first four ionization energies of these two atoms, and I want you to tell me whether, which one is sodium and which one is aluminum based upon anything you happen to know from the periodic table about sodium and aluminum's atoms. What do you think? Can we answer or? Yes, please answer. Okay. Um, so I know atom one is sodium because um, the first ionization energy is really low and the successive ones are significantly greater. So what does that mean the successive ones are? They're... Like the second, third, and fourth ionization energies. Yeah, so what is they're... that? If they're really, really high, what is, where are they in the sodium atom? Oh, they're um, below its... Uh, they're in the level under the uh, valence Right, they're not valence electron. electrons, they're core electrons. Core, long, uh, core electrons, yeah. So quickly recognized that the first atom had one low ionization energy and then they got really, really high. That means it must have one electron really far from the nucleus and then all the rest are closer. So what atom has one electron really far from the nucleus, sodium or aluminum, look on the periodic table. Sodium has one valence electron, you one, draw one dot in its dot notation, atom one has to be sodium. If you look at this arrangement here, that top electron beep, would be pulled off easily, but any other electrons are coming from the second energy level way harder. Can you see why atom two would have to be aluminum? Do you want another answer? Yeah, go ahead and answer. Uh, well, the, the first one isn't too much energy, um, but the successive one at the second ionization energy is like almost triple. Um, so that looks like it's dropping from the P orbital to the S orbital. And then it's just about a 50% increase to the next one, which is from the same um, orbital. But then it's like four or five times the amount, which is dropping an entire energy level again. That's correct. And so Mr. Shiner, I'm just going to get too caught up between difference in sublevels. So if you look at a series of ionization energies, look for the one big jump because the one big jump is going to indicate when you switch from an outer energy level to an inner energy level. So 500 to 1800 to 2700, there's different percent differences between those, as you said, but whoa, there's a big jump between 2000 and 11,000. So mm -hmm. that means the first three electrons, whether they're in S or P orbitals, must be in the highest energy level of this atom. This must have three valence electrons, and then the fourth electron would have to come from the second energy level, and that's why its value is 11,000. 577. That has to be aluminum. Does that make sense? Yeah. Lovely. Very good for that. Okay. So you can pull every single electron off of an atom if you want. That's great. What we're going to do is we're going to talk about a trend on the periodic table based upon only removing one electron from an atom. And these are going to be trends in first ionization energies. I'm going to tell you the trends. And then we're going to see if we can explain the trends, because I'm going to want you to understand why. So first, we're going to talk about a row on the periodic table or a period. And as you move from left to right across the periodic table, it turns out that the energy needed to pull the first electron off of each of those atoms gets greater and greater and greater. So the first ionization energy, we say, increases moving to the right. Now, I'm going to ask you why, and I'm going to sort of answer it today, but when we come to the test, you're going to be answering it, not me. So why would the ionization energies increase moving to the right? Two factors from yesterday. 
It's the nuclear charge and it's the amount of shielding. Those are the only things that have an effect on these periodic trends. So let me take a sodium atom, which has 11 protons in the nucleus and 11 electrons. And the ionization energy depends upon the attraction between the outer electron and the nucleus, however strong that is. It's gonna take a certain amount of energy to pull that top electron off. If we move to the right of sodium and go to magnesium, has a greater nuclear charge. Also has another outer electron, but we now have to figure out what's gonna be the effect of the greater nuclear charge and the extra outer electron on the attraction between the nucleus and just one of those outer electrons. So we have a greater nuclear charge. That means that the outer electron will be attracted more strongly to the nucleus. If it's attracted more strongly, and this is what you have to be able to rationalize in your mind, if the outer electron's attracted more strongly, is it harder or easier to pull the electron out? It's harder. So it takes more energy. So as long as you can rationalize that, then we'll be okay here. So if it holds it more tightly, it takes more energy to pull it out. So the higher nuclear charge holds the electron more tightly, increasing the ionization energy. But wait, how's the shielding affected in these two? What would you say about the shielding of the sodium atom and the magnesium atom? How do they compare? They're equal. Exactly the same, because I did not change any electrons in the first or second energy levels, and those are the ones that are shielding. So the ionization energy always increases moving to the right because the removed electron is being attracted by an increasing nuclear charge as you move to the right because the atomic numbers get higher as you go from left to right, while the shielding of the nuclear charge remains the same. Any answer you explain to me about a periodic trend, I gotta be able to hear what's happening to the nuclear charge and what's happening to the shielding. You need to be able to say the nuclear charge is getting greater, the shielding is staying the same. So what does that mean? You attract the electrons more strongly so it takes more energy to pull them out, okay? Nuclear charge increases while the shielding remains the same, right? If you knew Led Zeppelin, you'd really appreciate that. Yeah, but oh well. Let's go to a group on the periodic table. If you go down a column on the periodic table, it turns out that the first ionization energies decrease going down a column. <clears throat> so let's see why that is. Here's a picture of a lithium atom. The ionization energy is gonna be determined by how strongly the nucleus attracts the outer electron. That's the first electron that would be pulled off of a lithium atom. If I go down the column to the element below lithium, which would be sodium, Sodium atom looks like this, so we have to think about what's gonna be true about the attraction between this nucleus and that outer electron there. So first, what's happening to the nuclear charge? Well, sodium's nuclear charge is bigger. So if that were the only factor that changed with a bigger nuclear charge, what should be true about sodium's ionization energy compared to lithium's? It's greater. Should be greater, right? Perfect. But you have to account for the second phenomenon, which is the amount of shielding. The lithium atom, you only have one energy level shielding the outer shell. But the sodium atom has two, so it has more shielding, which means it blocks the nucleus more, which means it doesn't allow the nucleus to attract the outer electron. It's actually working in opposition to the nuclear charge. Austin, if you want to turn your volume down, we can get some background noise there. Yeah, sorry about that. No problem. So it turns out that the shielding effect outweighs the nuclear charge effect. So you would say even though sodium's nuclear charge is bigger, sodium has more shielding, so therefore the outer electron is held less tightly, so pink, more easy to pull off. So notice I've inferred that here. Even though the nuclear charge is increasing, the removed electron is more shielded from the nuclear charge and therefore it's attracted less strongly, so it's held less strongly, so it takes less energy to remove it, okay? If that makes sense, then on the periodic table, what atom do you think would have the highest first ionization energy? Hydrogen. Fluorine. Uh, keep going up and to the right. Helium. Helium. Helium, because Helium. Helium. Helium, that's the, atom that has the least amount of shielding and the greater nuclear, greatest nuclear charge in that row. What atom would have the lowest first ionization energy? Francium. Francium. Did those answers sound familiar? They're the exact answers from yesterday because the ion, first ionization energy trend 
exactly matches the trend in atomic radii, although it's kind of the opposite, right? So on the periodic table, we learn the biggest atoms were in the bottom left-hand corner. And just think about that. What are big atoms? They have lots and lots and lots of shielding. So the electrons so far from the nucleus, beep, pulled off easily. Small atoms are in the upper right-hand corner. And what's true about small atoms? Their outer electrons are really, really close to the nucleus. So they're held really tightly. So they have a high ionization energy. And that's the natural trend for ionization energies. Does that make sense? So wait, Professor, why is it, I understand, I understand now why it's helium, but doesn't hydrogen only have that one electron? So it's its only core electron. So it takes <laughs> even more energy to remove that since it's directly attracted to the nucleus. So hydrogen has no, hydrogen has no core electrons. It has one valence electron, no core electrons. So it has one proton with no shielding. Helium has two protons with no shielding because it has two valence electrons, no core electrons as well. The shielding or core electrons have to be inner energy level electrons and heliums are both in the same energy level, the first energy level, so they don't shield. So because helium has two protons in the nucleus, it will hold its both of its outer shell electrons more tightly. Okay, yeah. so there's more attraction. Okay, I understand. Lovely. Now, there are a couple of exceptions to the trends in first ionization energies. And I want to point these out to you and see if we can understand them. These exceptions occur in every period, every row on the periodic table. I'm going to do one example, but this is going to apply to every single row exactly the same way. I'm going to look at the elements in the second period of the periodic table. Lithium, beryllium, boron, yada, yada, yada. And we would expect, because the nuclear charge is increasing as we go across the period and the shielding is staying the same, that the ionization energies for the first electron in each of these atoms would get bigger and bigger and bigger. And it essentially does. Lithium is 519, beryllium is 900, carbon 10,088, so uh, nitrogen 1406, fluorine 1682, and neon 2080. That's the trend we just talked about. I left two blank because there's two exceptions. For some reason, boron has a lower ionization energy than you would have thought. You would have thought maybe it'd be like 990 or 1,000. Oxygen, you think it might be 1,500, but they're lower values. Let's see if we can understand why. And this is going to go back to maybe something that Mr. Shiner was talking about earlier. It's going to have to do with the sublevels. So for us to understand what's happening in the boron atom, I'm going to compare it to the element right before it. Because when we say there's an exception, it's the fact that boron has a lower ionization energy than the element before it. It's lower than beryllium's where it should be higher. Well, what's happening in beryllium? Beryllium has four protons and four electrons. They're arranged like this. And the electron that would be removed from a beryllium atom, I've colored in green, okay? Boron has five protons and five electrons. Let me draw the orbital notation for that. It looks like this. And the green electron is the one that would be pulled off in a boron atom. So why do you think that boron electron comes off more easily than a beryllium electron, even though boron has more protons in its nucleus? What could be the possible explanation for that? Because S uh, orbitals have less shielding uh, okay. to the nucleus. Oh, and that's a great way to say it. The S electrons in S orbitals experience less shielding than electrons in p orbitals, or you could say electrons in s orbitals penetrate the shielding or have more radial probability distribution inside the shielding, so they attract more strongly, whereas electrons in p orbitals do not penetrate the shielding as much, and so therefore they're attracted uh, less strongly. Mm -hmm. So any way to say that, however you like that, that sounds great. The point is the removed electron for the boron is in a p orbital, whereas the removed electron from beryllium was in an s orbital. And the difference is electrons in p orbitals are more shielded from the nuclear charge than electrons in s orbitals. So if you ever have an electron arrangement in which the atom has one p electron, so that would be the entire boron column on the periodic table, boron, aluminum, gallium, indium, thallium, those guys are always going to have a lower ionization energy than you would expect because they have one electron in this brand new P sublevel that does not penetrate the shielding very much. So it's really shielded. So it's pulled off more easily. So boron is in the 13th column on the periodic table. 
that whole column is always having a lower ionization energy than the column before it. Does that make sense? Let's look at the other exception. Let's look at oxygen. And to figure out why oxygen is lower than we would expect, we're gonna compare it to the element before it. And so I'm gonna draw the orbital notation for nitrogen first. Nitrogen has seven, valence, seven total electrons and the one that's in green is the one that would be pulled off if you applied the ionization energy to a nitrogen atom. Mm -hmm. Oxygen has one more electron, so let me draw its orbital notation and I'll highlight in green the electron that would be pulled off for the oxygen. So they're both in the same sublevel. They're both in 2p orbitals. So it's not the same reason that boron was lower than beryllium. So can you look at these two orbital notations and give me an explanation for even though oxygen has more protons in its nucleus, why oxygen all of a sudden has a lower ionization energy than nitrogen? Um, can I answer? Yes, ma'am. So it has a lower ionization energy because the first three electrons in the 2p orbital are all spinning uh, cl clockwise, I think, and then parallel the... Spin, you say. Sorry? You can call that parallel spin, that's what they do. Yeah, parallel, and then this one, the fourth one is spinning in the opposite direction from that one, and so because of that, it would take less energy. So I'll tell you, according to, to physics, it. no, it's not the spin that's doing that. It's where the electron is. That green electron in oxygen is in the same orbital as another electron. What do those two electrons do to each other? They repel each other. That's more important than the spin. They're okay. In the space. They're repelling, so one of them already wants to get out of there, so it just takes less energy. I'm personifying again. I scolded <laughs> you at the beginning of the period, and here I go. Okay, so sorry about that. So it's all right. <laughs> that electron is repelling against the other one in its orbital, requiring less energy to pull it out. So if you're ever in a situation in a P sublevel where you've finally paired a couple of electrons together, that paired electron is gonna come out more easily than you would think. The ionization energy is gonna be lower. So the removed electron for oxygen is paired. It's experiencing electron-electron repulsion in its orbital, maybe the 2px, whereas the removed electron from nitrogen is not. So that little bit of repulsion there lowers its ionization energy. That makes sense? Any questions on that? Okay, if not, let's go to our final trend that I want you to be familiar with. And this is the trend in what's called something that's called electron affinity, abbreviated E sub A. And it's kind of the opposite of ionization energy where ionization energy is removing an electron from an atom Electron affinity is the energy change for the addition of an electron to an atom. And once again, in our definition, we say to a gaseous atom. So if you wanted to write a chemical equation to show electron affinity, you would write a neutral atom in its gaseous state. And in this case, you'd be adding an electron to it and you would create an ion, but it now has one extra negative charge. So you'd be creating a negatively charged ion, okay? so. There's gonna be an energy change associated with this and it's always gonna be the same sign. I want you to think about this. You have an electron way out in outer space all by itself, it's not attracting anybody. And then you bring it into the atom and you put it in an orbital and now it's next to a nucleus. What does it do next to a nucleus? Does it attract or repel? Attract. So if it attracts, that means it releases energy because an attractive energy is negative. So electron affinities are always exothermic processes. When you take an electron that's out of an atom, not attracting anybody, put it into a nucleus, into an atom so it can attract to the nucleus, it's gonna become more stable and releases its excess energy. So electron affinities are always gonna be exothermic, which means they're gonna be negative numbers, okay? Now, I wanna talk about the trends for electron affinities in a period and in a group and see if we can explain these as well. <clears throat> we'll be talking about the trend for the first electron affinity. So just adding one electron to an atom, but much like ionization energies, you could add one electron, that would be the first electron affinity. Add a second, that would be the second electron affinity. But we'll just be talking about trends in first electron affinities. And it turns out that in a period, the electron affinity decreases moving to the right. Now, I did this grammatically correct. Electron affinity decreasing 
means that as you go from left to right, the electron affinities go from negative 100 to negative 200 to negative 300 to negative 400. So in parentheses, I wrote maybe a better way to comprehend it. They become more exothermic. They release more energy. Now, some people will look at negative 100, then negative 200, then negative 300, then negative 400 and go, oh, the electron affinities are getting bigger. And I understand where you're coming from, but that's mathematically incorrect. They're actually decreasing. So really what I have in parentheses is probably a better way to say that and think about it. I might say in the period, the electron affinities become more exothermic, moving to the right, and don't worry about the increase or decrease because the negative numbers sometimes give you a headache when you think about that. Now, why would that be? If you imagine a free electron is flying by an atom, what's gonna attract it into the atom? It's the nuclear charge. So the free electron is attracted by a nuclear charge. And as you move from left to right, the nuclear charge is increasing. So an electron will be attracted more strongly to atoms that have a greater nuclear charge. So as you go from left to right, the electron affinities become more exothermic, more energy is released because the electron will be attracted more strongly. Wow, what's happening to the shielding here? As you go from left to right, it be the same as the shielding. ionized energy. Shouldn't the be same. the same. Yeah, shielding remains the same, right? Okay. So if the shielding doesn't change, if you go from left to right, you're putting more protons in the nucleus. An electron flying by whoo, will be attracted way more strongly and release more energy. So we see they become more negative or more exothermic, moving to the right, if that makes sense. Okay. One exception to that I want to talk about here, and that's when you get to the very last element in any row. Those are called the noble gases. They do not attract electrons the most. In fact, they actually attract electrons the least. We'll have to explain that before we're done today. Okay. Now, in a group, that means a column, the electron affinities increase going down. And a better way to say that is become, they become less exothermic. They go negative 300, negative 200, negative 100. They become less exothermic moving down a column. Now, why would that be? What's happening to the nuclear charge? The nuclear charge is increasing, okay? So even though the nuclear charge is increasing, because what would that do? That would attract the electrons more and they'd release more energy. So that means they should become more exothermic. So even though the nuclear charge is increasing, what's preventing the electron from being attracted into the nucleus? What's the other factor? Greater shielding greater shielding blocks the nuclear charge so electrons are not attracted as much so they don't release as much energy. That's exactly true. So even though the nuclear charge is increasing, a free electron is more shielded from the nuclear charge so it isn't attracted as much, okay? <clears throat> I hope you, you know, when you go back and look at these tonight, look at the, the uh, reasons for the trends in atomic radii, ionization energy, and electron affinity. These are all the exact same answers every single time. All the periodic trends follow the same basic concept of, of uh, nuclear charge and shielding. So what we've just talked about here is the most exothermic electron affinities would wind up being way up here in the upper right-hand corner, except for the noble gases for some inexplicable reason right now. And then the least exothermic electron affinities would be down here in the lower left-hand corner. So once again, following the trends of the other two. Now, the noble gases are an exception, and there's a couple of different exceptions here. This one actually has the most exceptions of all. And so I'm going to talk about those, and this will be our big finale for today when we get through these. So exceptions to the trends in first electron affinities. <clears throat> there's one exception that happens in a group as you go down a column on the periodic table. And it actually only happens in the P block of the periodic table, so it doesn't apply to the entire periodic table. So if you focus in only on the very right side of the periodic table, whose elements put their last electron in a P orbital, it turns out that uh, what you would expect as you, as you go up a group to the top, because there's less and less shielding, the atoms will attract electrons more strongly and release more energy. But when you get to the very top of the P block and the elements of the top are boron and carbon and nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine and neon, those atoms are actually pretty small. And when you add an electron to a small atom, all of a sudden the electrons get crowded with each other 
and they start to repel some. So the really, really small atoms in the P section, when they gain an electron because of this repulsion, don't release as much energy as you would theoretically expect. So they actually don't have the most exothermic electron in the P block. The row below them, the three P block, actually are the most exothermic. So in the P block of the periodic table, adding electrons to the small atoms, those are, that are in the second period, turn out resulting in large electron-electron repulsion. So their first electron affinities are slightly less exothermic than the little bit bigger atoms below them, even though the atoms below them have a little bit more shielding. When I showed you that periodic trend just a couple of moments ago, where we had the least exothermic atom in the bottom left-hand corner and the most exothermic electron affinity atom in the upper right-hand corner, although we blacked out the noble gases. If you don't count the noble gases, the atom closest to the upper right-hand corner of the periodic table is fluorine. Fluorine theoretically has the most exothermic electron affinity, but that's theoretical. It turns out that because fluorine is such a small atom, when it gains an electron, there's a little bit of repulsion occurring there, doesn't release as much energy as you would think. So if we look at the actual electron affinities for elements in fluorine's column, the very bottom of the column is iodine. It has a lot of shielding, so it doesn't attract an electron very much, so it doesn't release as much energy. Its electron affinity is negative 295. Bromine has a little bit less shielding, so its electron affinity is higher, negative 343. Chlorine has even less shielding, so it attracts electrons more strongly, negative 349. And fluorine, which would have the least amount of shielding, we would expect to be three, negative 350 something. But unfortunately, it's a lower value than chlorine's. And the reason for that has to do with the fact that it's so small, the added electron causes some repulsion. So therefore, if I were to ask you what element on the periodic table has atoms with the most exothermic electron affinities, you of course would not look at the noble gases, so you'd look at the column right next to that, and that would be this column, and you'd think, oh, fluorine does, but oh, wait, fluorine's extra small, so it's not the one with the most exothermic electron affinity of all the elements. Actually, chlorine is the element whose atoms have the most exothermic electron affinities. So that's one little trend or exception I'd like you to be aware of. The next lab we do on Thursday will be on the periodic table. We'll be looking at properties of all the different chemical elements. And then you're going to have a whole bunch of post-lab questions. And the post-lab questions are going to be on atomic radii and ionization energies and electron affinities. And I'll be asking you some things about what are the exceptions and what atom has the highest or lowest value for each of the wow. different properties. So we're going to get a good deal of practice on this before the week is out. Okay. <clears throat> Now, the more interesting uh, exceptions are the ones that occur as you go from left to right across the periodic table. So these would be exceptions to the trends in first, ions, first electron affinities in a period. And I'm, this is going to be true for every single period across the periodic table. I'm just going to pick one at random. I'm going to pick the fourth period. And we're going to look at the elements in the S and P blocks of the fourth row on the periodic table. So potassium and calcium from the 4S sublevel block and then gallium through krypton in the 4p sublevel block. And if I give you the electron affinities for these, we would expect them all to be negative. And as you move from left to right, because the nuclear charge is increasing and the shielding is staying the same, you should be able to attract electrons more strongly and therefore give off more energy. So they should become more and more negative. So if we start with potassium, negative 49, gallium is negative 76, germanium is negative 116, selenium is negative 195, and bromine is negative 325. This is exactly what we were talking about. But there's three of them I didn't give to you, and that's because they're exceptions. Calcium's is almost zero. We actually didn't even measure it. It's hard to tell, negative 0.3, negative one, I don't know what. Uh, arsenic's is negative 75, and then krypton, our noble gas, is approximately equal to zero as well. Why would that be? Well, it turns out the reason for krypton being close to zero and being so not negative and calcium being close to zero are the exact same reasons. And let me draw the orbital notations for both calcium and krypton. So calcium, if we do a, an abbreviated form, would have argon in brackets, and then it has two electrons in a forest sublevel. 
Krypton, we could do argon in brackets, then it fills the 4s, fills the 3d, fills the 4p. When you're trying to explain this exception, first you have to be really clear what property are we talking about, ionization energy or electron affinity? It's electron affinity. What do you do in electron affinity? You add an electron to the atom, okay? So there must be something not too good about adding an electron to a calcium atom or a krypton atom. Can you see what that would be? If you were gonna put an electron into calcium, where would that electron go? 3D sublevel. See, there's no more room in the 4S sublevel. Does that make sense? There's no more room for it. It has to go into a brand new sublevel. Do you know why the 3D sublevel fills after the 4S? ready for that because that's going to be a question on the test in another week and a half or whenever you take your test. Why does the 3D sublevel fill after the 4S or why does the 4S fill before the 3D? The 4S shields um, the 3D. The 4S doesn't shield the 3D. An outer orbital can't shield an inner orbital. Ms. Quigley, you're going to give a shot at it? I mean, I was, I was going to say that the 4S, um, the electrons in there are um, or no, the, the, um, charge of the, uh, I don't know. <laughs> good, good try. That's okay. The forest it, orbital fills before, the, go ahead, give it a shot. I thought that it was because the forest orbital gets closer to the nucleus, so therefore the electrons fill before the 3D. When you give that answer, you got to put one more prepositional phrase in there, otherwise I might have to mark that wrong. The 4S orbital allows its electrons to be closer to the nucleus inside the shielding than an electron in a 3D orbital. It doesn't go inside the shielding as much. It's better to say inside the shielding than close to the nucleus. Sometimes that infers an incorrect thought. So whichever one allows more time inside the shielding to be more stable. That's why that 4S fills. So now if you're going to tell a new electron, you have to go into a 3D orbital it doesn't get to penetrate through the shielding very much. It doesn't get to attract the nucleus. Pfft, doesn't release hardly any energy. So anytime you're putting an electron into a brand new sublevel, that brand new sublevel is not as good a place to be. The electron will not attract the nucleus as much, so it doesn't release much energy. And can you see what krypton looks like? Where's the next electron going to have to be added to into a krypton atom? The 5s? So it has to go into a new sublevel. That's actually even worse. It's going to a new energy level, but it's the same point. It goes into a new sublevel, which is more shielded from the nuclear charge. So the added electron does not experience the nuclear attraction much, doesn't give off as much energy. Okay? So the added electron, in both cases, calcium and krypton, will go into an orbital of a new sublevel where it'll be very shielded from the nuclear charge. So if it doesn't attract much, doesn't give off much energy. That's why the electron affinities are really, really low, maybe negative two, negative one, or a virtually zero. So that'll happen in the entire second column in the periodic table because their orbital notations are just like calcium. They have their S sublevel filled. The next electron has to go into a new sublevel. And certainly the noble gases will always be about zero because their P sublevel is filled the next electron will have to go into the S sublevel of the next energy level, okay? Let's look at the arsenic, okay? Let me do the orbital notation for arsenic and see if we can determine why its electron affinity is not something like negative 150, because I think it probably should be something like that. So arsenic's electron arrangement looks like this. Could you see any reason why the addition of electron to an arsenic atom would not release a whole bunch of energy? Why is it releasing less energy than you would expect? Um, can I answer? I feel like I'm yes. doing all these. Um, the 4p orbital has um, three electrons in already there. And so once you, like when another one is added, um, it's being repelled more. So there's less energy. Released. But, yeah. Release. Exactly. So when you have a sublevel like the P level with one electron in each orbit, if you add an electron to that, it's going to pair up. And when it pairs up, that causes repulsion. So the amount of energy released will be less. So that whole arsenic column on the periodic table, 
it has three electrons in its p sub level, one, one, one. You, if you add an electron to that, it's going to pair up. It's always going to be lower than the elements in the column row. Does that make sense? Those are the exceptions. Let me end with this question for you. In the fourth period on the periodic table, there are uh, two other elements that would have lower or less exothermic electron affinities than the element before them. What two would those be? Take about one minute or so and think about it, but don't say it out loud. And we'll see if we can figure it out. I've given you the hint fourth period, so you're only looking at the fourth row on the periodic table. So, of course, you wouldn't want to write down an answer for an element in any of the other periods because they would definitely be wrong. So, from the fourth period, anybody want to make a guess? What two elements do you think would have less exothermic electron affinity? Um, would it manganese be chromium? Zinc? Okay, so chromium um, wasn't correct. Um, I said manganese chromium? and zinc. Zinc? manganese and zinc. Can you see why that is? Uh, you Tell want me. me to explain? Or? I think I will draw a little picture if that's okay. Okay, and also I think someone has their mic on because it's echoing. Uh, Mr. Osinian probably, right? Okay, good. So here is a... Hmm, what do I have? The 4S. Here's manganese. Where's manganese going to put its next electron? Um, in the first space uh, where there's already right, an pair electron. Up, horrible, right? They pair up, they cause repulsion. That's exactly like the arsenic example, right? So. I could copy it all, I guess not. So if you're going to wind up being the first paired electron in a sublevel, if you have a half-filled sublevel already, that sublevel, when it accepts an electron, is going to have repulsion occur because it's going to pair up. That makes sense? So that's why manganese is one. What was zinc? Zinc's orbital rotation looks like this. Where's the next electron going to have to go in zinc? Repeat. New sublevel, and when that happens, that sublevel is more shielded from the nuclear charge, doesn't release as much energy. So this is exactly like the calcium and the krypton examples. 